Thank you. You may be seated. Doing that pre-sermon run <laughs> can be a little harder as I get older. All right, let's take our Bibles in turn to Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32. Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32. It's a passage that we've been interrupted on three times now, and so hopefully we will be finishing up today. It's the plague of the flies. I'll fly away, part three, Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32. So what have we seen so far? Let's see if you can remember the first four plagues with me. Number one was blood, all right. Number two was frogs. Number three was lice. And number four was flies. Now, I didn't get a very good response. Now, we've just told you, so let's go through them again. Number one was blood. Number two was frogs. Number three was lice. Number four was flies. And we've seen in each case that these describe God's judgment on various of the pagan gods of Egypt. We've also seen that these portray for us and foreshadow for us the judgments of God that are going to be taking place in the book of Revelation. Very interesting that God sent those judgments not merely as a warning to Egypt, but really as a warning to the entire world of what yet lies ahead and even worse than what happened when it destroyed the land of Egypt. The flies. Now it's significant, as we've mentioned, I'm going to summarize very quickly for us the things that we've seen so far to get our minds back on track because there's some very important application that I want to make today. It's significant to note that God gave 13 verses to the plague of flies, which is much greater than, for example, the plague of lice, which only had four verses. <clears throat> we saw that there were 3,000 kinds of lice, but there are 200, uh, 240,000 different kinds of flies, and only 120,000 of those have been scientifically described today. We saw that every time flies are mentioned, the word is in italics. That means that those words are supplied by the translators and are based on their understanding of the Hebrew word that is translated in the passage, swarms, S-W-A-R-M-S. There were swarms of something that was dangerous, we discover as we read through this passage, that affected both men and animals, not something that was merely irritating. It wasn't the American housefly that they were having a problem with. We saw that the word translated swarms, arov, is the modern Hebrew word for a mosquito. That's what they use for mosquito because of the way that mosquitoes swarm and bite. And by the way, only the females bite. It comes from the root arav, meaning to braid, intermix, metal, or mingle, which is exactly what biting and sucking insects do when they penetrate the skin to inject their fluid and then extract the blood. The text states that there was a mixture of different kinds of swarming insects, and there are many kinds of biting and blood-sucking flies. And we also saw that the, the insects were not only in the air, but it says, and on the ground. We talked about that a good deal. Biting and blood-sucking flies are serious disease vectors. And then we saw, and this is what tied us into the plagues in the book of Revelation, some of the rabbinic scholars interpreted that these meant swarms of wild beasts, not merely swarms of flies. The key point that we noted, these swarms were supernatural, not merely a matter of breeding on the dead frogs and the dead fish, because they did not affect the land of Goshen where the Jews were living. The Nile was full of dead fish, and the dead frogs were all over the land, including in Goshen, but the plague of flies did not hit Goshen. The Jews were specifically excluded. You heard me read that this morning in the text. They were excluded from the plague so that Pharaoh would get it through his thick skull that this was really a miracle by the God of the Jews. We noted also that not merely the air was filled with flies, but also the ground. That gave us a hint of at least one kind of insect that spends most of its time on the ground, which was also one of the sacred gods of Egypt, which was a scarab beetle. We saw the close connection with dung beetles, scarabs, and flies. Just like flies gather around and eat dung, scarabs also gather around dung and eat it. The plague shows just how low men stoop to worship the filth that is not God. So everywhere the Egyptians walked, they were smushing one of their gods between their toes. Paul wrote, that this would be the result of men refusing to worship God and give him the thanks. And he tells us in Romans chapter 1 that they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. 
Paul specifically mentions that men worship bugs because they fail to glorify God and fail to be thankful to him. And that's in the immediate context of Paul talking about creation as the means by which God has revealed himself. Creation is the first level of divine revelation, and if you get it wrong there, you'll get it wrong every place else. There's more in this passage also about creation, and I hope we'll get to that today. Since the word for swarming refers to these biting, blood-sucking type of insects, they're not just harmless insects. Flies were considered a god, we saw, by various ancient cultures, specifically part of the worship of the Philistine city of Ekron, where the Bible tells us that they worship Beelzebub, literally translated, the Lord of the Flies. And Ahaziah, king of Israel, tried to inquire of Beelzebub, and as a result, God cursed him to death. In other words, you worship a pagan god, and the sentence is the death penalty. Beelzebub, we saw, was also known as the Lord of the Dung. In Matthew and Luke, the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. So Beelzebub, the one who's known as the Lord of the Flies, the Lord of Dung, was still around and well-known 850 years after that incident with Ahaziah in the king of Israel. And he hadn't disappeared. We saw that even today, as early as 19, or late as 1963, and then remade in 1990. There was a movie called, or yes, a film called The Lord of the Flies. And we talked about that. Satan appears that way in every generation. This is not just one of the minor demons. This is Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. Jesus said, that is Satan. In the context there in the Gospels, the Jews demanded a sign from heaven. That God would provide manna through Moses like he did in the wilderness, that God would provide them with food too. They'd just seen his miracle of feeding the 5,000. So the Gospels connect the Lord of the Flies to the Exodus narrative, and the Gospels take us back to the ten plagues and the contrast between God and the demon gods of Egypt. We then tied the full circle together and showed that the Lord of the Flies is still known today. And the key issue in the Jesus versus Beelzebub narrative in all three of the Synoptic Gospels gave us the definition of the unpardonable sin, which was saying that Jesus performed his miracles in the power of the devil was what constituted the unpardonable sin. We saw that in Mark 3.22. The scribes which came down from Jerusalem said he hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And then Jesus responds in verses 28 and following, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith they, soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said, he, that is Jesus, hath an unclean spirit. That's the unpardonable sin. Every other sin can be forgiven and has been forgiven, but not the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit working in Jesus to perform the miracles that Jesus pr produced while here on earth, and the people saw Jesus doing it. And so that was the unpardonable sin. We summarize the key elements for the unpardonable sin. We'll not go over that again. For our study of the plague of flies, the key was the connection that Jesus made between Satan and Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies. Jesus is the giver of life. Satan is the perpetrator of death. We saw the many different diseases, death-causing diseases, that these biting flies cause. They're the principal vectors for malaria, dengue fever, West Nile virus, yellow fever, encephalitis, many other infectious diseases. They're the principal vectors for the growth of pathogenetic biological agencies, viruses, viroids, prions, microorganisms, bacteria, roundworms that live out inside the body, pinworms, fungi, and other parasites, sand flies in particular, which are found in the Middle East, in Egypt also, carry a disease called Leishmaniasis, common in North Africa and Egypt, which is a skin-eating flesh-eating bacteria that produces skin ulcers, ulcers in the mouth and the nose, enlargement of the spleen and the liver. 12 million people are currently infected with it in 98 countries around the world. They also produce other fever viruses, Papatachi fever and Chandipra virus, which is a deadly cousin of rabies. We saw that there are only 4,500 different kinds of biting and blood-sucking flies. They're in the category of Tabinidae, or Tabinid flies. Here in the United States, they're known as horse flies, but there are many different types, and we listed those for you before. Most importantly, we saw that you can't get away from them, neither could the Egyptians. And we saw that God, the sovereign God, plans everything in advance down to the smallest details. Because horse flies and the tabinid flies all have different gestational periods for their larvae. They take one to two years, not just a few days. One to two years, so that the flies that showed up on that day 
all having different gestational periods, all had to show up on exactly the same day. That's a miracle, folks. And then they only live for a few days. But they came precisely on schedule as God, who predestines all things, even the very hairs of our head, had planned in advance. Every one of those billions and billions and billions of flies showed up on a single day to teach Pharaoh a lesson. God brought the flies to Pharaoh on precisely the day that he had pre-planned in eternity past. They metamorphosized into adult flies precisely the same time. We noted that you can't get away from biting flies by swatting at them. They generally persist in attacking until they support clear their quarry or they are killed. There's no truce. You either kill them or you get eaten by them. They chase their intended targets, even if it tries to run away. They're very nasty little creatures. We gave you illustrations of what these killer flies are like. We gave you the illustration of the kamikaze pilots, the suicide bomb planes in World War II, the child bombers of the Viet Cong during the Vietnam War, the Muslim suicide bombers, everything from the World Trade Center to Muslim women who blow themselves up when they're among Jews. We saw that those are demon-possessed people. The devil has not changed his tactics. Satan is still the author of death. Jesus is the author of life. God was powerfully demonstrating through the plague of flies what the filthy, destructive gods of Egypt were like and that he had the power to bring them against their own worshipers and destroy them in one day by his word. That's a powerful God. He's in control even of the Lord of the Flies. They were clearly supernatural. Billions of dangerous, blood-sucking, biting flies appearing in a single day, all hatched on a single day, even though they have different gestational periods. Not one of those flies flew to Goshen, which was in walking distance of Pharaoh's palace. The plague personally affected Pharaoh, because it says so in the text. So they're going to be on you. When Moses pronounced that curse, he said it's on you. And that's one of the reasons I think that Pharaoh was so antsy to get rid of the flies. The first time he offers a compromise is with the plague of the flies. They're going to be on you. They got through to everybody else and Pharaoh as well. And this is what fascinates me about the text. Did you notice Pharaoh is begging him to get rid of the flies and Moses is standing in front of Pharaoh with Aaron and there's not one fly biting Moses or Aaron. Everybody else is getting bitten in the room, but there's not one fly on Moses and Aaron. They don't have a problem. They didn't even have insect repellent. At a precisely stated time, God removed the flies, every one of them. Remember, miracles include precise timing as well as precise events. And it does not say that they just died like the frogs. It says God removed them. It's like a great giant vacuum cleaner that sucks in only flies came over the land of Egypt and went, and every fly was gone. God removed them. That was the first time that Pharaoh was willing to negotiate because it affected him in a very personal way. But when the problem disappeared, Pharaoh hardened his heart. That stubborn, rebellious, recalcitrant, willful disobedience and a deliberate refusal to submit to the revealed will of God. And as we pointed out last time, don't be too quick to judge Pharaoh because all of us have been in that position at some time. We knew the will of God and then we knew what the right thing was to do, but then we didn't do it. We decided we'd do something else. And so we're just like Pharaoh. We saw that there was even more because biting flies are not just of an aggressive vector against human beings, but also against animals. They have blood-borne diseases that they carry to animals. Apparently, Pharaoh cared, cared more about his animals than he did about his people. We saw that blood-sucking and blood-biting flies carry the equine infectious anemia virus that attacks horses, which was a serious problem for Pharaoh since he depended on his chariots. We saw that blood-biting and blood-sucking blood flies are also known to transmit anthrax among cattle and sheep. So you see why Pharaoh's kind of worried about having this many flies around. But God was going to use a different plague to get the cattle and the sheep. We saw that blood loss is a common and dangerous problem in animals when large flies are abundant. Some animals have been known to lose up to 300 milliliters of blood in a single day to tabinid flies, a loss that can weaken or even kill the animals. And there are reports of horse fly bites leading to fatal anaphylaxis in humans, although currently that is an extremely rare occurrence. But of course, it's going to get worse in tribulation. And we close that second message on the plague of flies with the answer to a question somebody asked, is it possible that these were bees? And I pointed out that I don't think so because the Hebrew word for bees is devora, which we would say in English, Deborah, that's where the name Deborah comes from. And that's a word that means to be diligently systematic, which is what bees are. Bees are beneficial, horse flies, mosquitoes, and other biting, blood-sucking flies are not. They've made it their purpose in life to attack and devour. The Bible distinguishes them also from flies in one passage, Isaiah chapter 14, where it says God will use both flies and bees 
in judgment. And you know Isaiah 14, uh, 7, verse 14 and following, because that's the Messianic passage that says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. The old virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. But as you drop down to verse 18, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day, just four verses later, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost parts of the rivers of Egypt. It takes you back to the floods. Flies Egypt. Flies Egypt. You get that for the first half. To the uttermost parts of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of the Assyria. Bee Assyria. Bee Assyria. Flies Egypt. Bee Assyria. Two different locations, two different types of insects. They're going to come as a means of judgment, and he explains that in verses 19 and 20. So verse 18 is a clear reference back to the plagues of the flies of Egypt. Verse 18 sets the flies apart from bees, which are compared to the Assyrians who are about to invade the land and conquer the northern ten tribes, but would only besiege the city of Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah, when God would kill 186,000 of them in one night, and then the king would return to Assyria. And that brings us to part three for today. And first of all, I think what we need to understand because it is hard for us to understand why in the world would anybody worship flies? Doesn't that strike you as kind of odd? I mean, isn't that weird? Why in the world would anybody worship flies? Well, you get a hint when you realize there is a super duper supernatural demonic being who's known as the Lord of the flies. Why would anybody worship flies? That's because we're Christians. We don't think that way, but the pagans worship any supernatural power that can harm them. Pagans are always busy trying to pacify the, quote, gods, busy trying to feed the gods, busy trying to do the things that the gods want them to do because they're afraid that if they don't do that, then the gods are going to smack them. Pagan religion is based only on fear. It's never based on love. It's never based on relationship. There's a God in heaven who will judge and he is worthy to be feared. But for the Christian, our relationship with the God whom we worship is based on our love for him because his love for us. We love him because he first loved us. It's based not merely on the Old Testament Mosaic law. If you do this, I'm going to smack you. It's based on a relationship with Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. So you have to be able to understand this, this plague of flies and why this is such a serious thing and why in the world anybody would worship flies in the first place. You have to get back to the think, like, what do the pagans think? They think that this is something that could really hurt them because they understand that the power behind the one who calls himself the Lord of the Flies is Satan himself. We know that those powers behind all these things that men worship are demons. And number two, Satan, the ruler of the demons, delights in defiling and destroying man who is made in the image of God. And what better way to do that than through flies? When Satan can defile a man, it's like ripping and shredding and throwing every filthy thing that he can at a picture of God. You see, you reflect the image of God. So if Satan can defile you, if he can make you filthy, if he can make you vile, if he can make you dirty, if he can rip and shred you, what he's doing is ripping and shredding a picture of God. The image of God, the reflection of God. He's not it! God has promises for you as a Christian that Satan will never get. And he hates you for that. So his goal is to defile you if he possibly can. Sort of brings to mind the, the hatred of the hippies in the 1960s burning the American flag or the violent Muslim mobs burning the pilots alive in their cages while the Muslims shout in, with joy and cheer and they put that on Facebook. Burning man to death in a steel cage as he screams and writhes. That's Satan, people. That's not the God of the universe who created all things and who loved us enough to send his son to die for us. Third, when Satan defiles a man, he loves to choose that which is most disgusting, most vile, and most degrading. Hence, he chose vicious, filthy, disgusting, dangerous, vile, dung-loving flies and beetles as the symbol through which the pagans would worship 
him. That brings us to some other key passages in the Bible that talk about the plague of flies in Egypt. For example, Psalm 78 has an extended section talking about the plagues of Egypt. They didn't forget in the Old Testament. That was supposed to be a, a turning point for Israel. Those plagues in Egypt, when God brought them out of Egypt, he formed them into a nation. The crossing of the Red Sea was the point at which Israel became not just a, a genetic related group of people. At, that was the point at which they became a nation under God as their ruler. A nation that would have first the tabernacle and then the temple. A nation that would come before God and offer him sacrifices on his holy Mount Zion in Jerusalem. They sang about that just a few minutes ago. The plagues are a key turning point in the life of Israel, and so we find the plagues on multiple occasions referenced in the rest of the Old Testament. Here's Psalm 78. It's an extended section talking about the plagues in Egypt, what God was teaching both Pharaoh and the children of Israel through the plagues and the deliverance of his people. And it clearly identifies the type of flies. We weren't just guessing back there when we understood that word swarms to be biting and blood-sucking insects. It clearly identifies the type of flies, flies in the plague as being biting and blood-sucking type. Starting in verse 41. We could read the whole thing, but we're not going to. We're just starting in verse 41. Yea, they turned their back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. How he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan. Now, here we go. Here are the plagues of Egypt. And had turned their rivers to blood and their floods that they could not drink. He sent diverse sorts of flies among them. Now look at the next phrase. Which devoured them. These weren't just dirty little creatures that they were smushing around and that were sitting on their skin and irritating them. It says they were flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and the sycamore trees with frost. He gave up their cattle also to the hail and their flocks to hot thunderbolts. Now look at verses 49 and 50. Very interesting verses here. He cast upon the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble by sending evil angels among them. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence and smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength in the tabernacles of Ham, but made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Now, I emphasized it as I was reading it, but I want to bring your attention to those three verses that I just mentioned. Verse 45 is obvious. It tells us what the flies did. It says, he sent diverse sorts of flies among them, which devoured them. There were multiple different kinds of flies. Same thing that we noted when we look back in the book of Exodus. It wasn't just one of the 4,500 different species of tabinid flies. It says he sent diverse kinds, different kinds, multiple kinds of swarms that devoured them. That verse tells us the flies were not just ordinary house flies. The flies devoured them. It also tells us that there was not just one kind of biting, blood-sucking fly. It says diverse sorts of flies. There were multiple kinds of tabinidae that was make it even more miraculous because, of course, all of those different tabinid species have different gestational periods. We mentioned that a moment ago, not just one kind popping out all at the same time. All of them hatched the full-grown flies on the day of the plague. We have also seen the connection with the dung beetles or scarabs through the principal demon Satan, the lord of the flies, and the lord of dung. We see how it fits the statement that there were many kinds of these insects and judgments on their gods. Interesting to look at the word devoured here. That word devoured is the Hebrew word akal, which means to eat, to dine, or to feed upon, which is precisely what biting and blood-sucking insects do. The second verse I want you to notice is verse 49 here. Psalm 78, 49. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Who are the evil angels? <laughs> I mean, if you know any theology at all, you know who the evil angels are, right? That's the demons. The evil angels are those one-third of the heavenly host that followed Satan in his rebellion against God. Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28, multiple places where we see the fall of Satan. Jesus describes the fall of Satan in the, in the Gospel of Luke. And he took one-third of the 
angels with him who are now the demons. We find he's the great dragon in heaven who Michael and his angels are going to fight against the, the devil and his angels, the evil angels. Did you get the point? God is in control even of where they go. Because it says God is the one who casts upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Satan can't do anything without the hand of God. You look at the first chapter of the book of Job and you discover that Satan comes among the sons of God, that is the angelic host that are there in heaven, and um, God says, where you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? Yeah, I know about Job. I mean, you've got such a hedge of protection around him that I can't touch him. God says to Satan, you can or you can't touch a certain person. God is going to prove Job's character. God allows Satan to touch Job. And you know the stages through which he goes. And then the, most of the book of Job is Job trying to figure out why in the world, when I've been worshiping the true God of heaven, do all these bad things happen to me? The same question that people ask you today. If there's a good God, why do bad things happen to his people? We've talked about that in detail in the past. I'll not preach that sermon again. But you should know the answer to that because that's the question people are going to ask you on the streets. Here's what was happening in the book of Exodus. God sent evil angels among them, the very demons that the Egyptians were worshiping through all these pagan gods, the ones that they were trying to pacify by their offerings and by their sacrifices and by their obeisance and by their stupidity of worshiping things as low as creatures that feed on dung, the creeping things that Paul mentions in Romans chapter 1. Those very demons were the ones that God used to execute the plagues through the creatures by whom they were worshipped. Third verse, verse 50. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence. That's before we reach the verse about the death of the firstborn, which is the next verse. We find that there was pestilence that was going on, and we're going to talk about that in future messages, the Lord willing, but I want you to see that it was not just the last plague that killed people. It wasn't just the last plague where we find the death of the firstborn. There was a plague that killed people and animals as well before that. People were dying as a result of all the plagues, although some of the plagues affected the death rate more severely than others. Notice something else. Notice the order of the plague sent uh, set out in Exodus because the next plague after flies very interesting to see what God is doing here next plague after flies is plague number five it's going to be a murrain or a pestilence pestilence was just mentioned here in our text in Psalm 78 a pestilence on the cattle, horses, donkeys, camels cattle, sheep, goats and so on the livestock if it's very well with the plague of flies, God moving through the land of Egypt in wave after wave of interconnected, interrelated plagues as the people of Egypt see their entire economic structure. You know what God is doing? He's destroying the economy of Egypt here. Not just making people miserable. He is destroying their economy. Egypt goes into a major economic decline at this point in history. Even the secular Egyptologists will admit that. They don't want to tie it to the 1440s which is when that economic collapse takes place. The liberals are trying to take you down to 1290 B.C. and make the exodus take place in 1290 so that there doesn't have to be a miracle of crossing the Red Sea where they can claim that the land of Goshen is up in the Nile Delta and the people just walk through the swampy marshes and down into the Sinai Peninsula. Listen, Paul says that's, that's hokey. Paul tells us that Arabia is in, excuse me, that uh, Sinai is in Arabia. He tells us that in the book of Galatians. It's not in the Sinai Peninsula although that's a traditional location, and it has been pumped up by all of the, the liberals that that's where Mount Sinai's got to be, where St. Catherine's Monastery is located. So what does a Greek Orthodox monastery full of dead bones of monks have to do with the giving of the law? Paul specifically says Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Arabia. It's a lot bigger peninsula than the Sinai Peninsula. You can spend 40 years wandering in Arabia and never cross the same ground twice. Well, back to the text. Preaching a different message there. <laughs> okay, 
So, um, where were we? Plague number five. It's going to be a murrain about the pestilences. And it causes the entire economic structure of Egypt to collapse around them. Just remember, God could do the same thing here in the United States, and I think he will. And God can bring about not only pain, but a nationwide Black Friday crash again. I want you to notice something else. Now, this is really important because we're going to see here the difference between the way believers understand what's going on and the way in which unbelievers understand what's going on. And we're going to see multiple illustrations of this all through Scripture. Notice this. I already pointed out that the blood rivers could produce dead frogs and fish and that dead frogs and dead fish could be the breeding ground for flies and that flies could carry disease that kill livestock. Do you see what God is doing? He's setting you up to have to make a choice. What God is doing here is blinding the minds of them that believe not. Because there are always, always, two possible explanations for the events of history. We see this over and over in the Bible. Either the events are supernatural, or the events are natural. People look at exactly the same evidence, but then they must explain it either as a natural event, or they must explain it as a supernatural event. Now, sometimes the event is so clearly supernatural that they balk at it. They can't figure out any naturalistic way to explain it. So God still gives them two choices. If it is supernatural, they can either explain it as the work of God, or they can explain it as the work of the devil. God's setting Egypt up here. God's setting the children of Israel up here. They're going to have to make a choice. God's setting Pharaoh up here. God set the magicians up here. God sets modern Jews up here. God sets the church up here. God sets the secular world around us up here. Here's a key illustration of that. People see the same evidence, but then they explain it as a natural event or a supernatural, or if it's supernatural, they have two choices, either it's from God or the devil. For example, we saw that the Pharisees, and we used this when we were talking about the Beelzebub question, we saw that the Pharisees knew that the miracles of Jesus were supernatural, that there was no way they could feasibly use the naturalistic explanation for what Jesus had done. So they claimed that the source of the casting out of devils was the devil, made the wrong choice. As a result, committed the unpardonable sin. As a result, all of those Pharisees are in hell today. We have no question about it. They didn't re later repent and get saved. They had committed the unpardonable sin. Not an unpardoned sin, because the sin of unbelief can be pardoned. All of us were in that state at one point. But the unpardonable sin, because they said he casts out demons by Beelzebub. Number two, another illustration. We see God's voice from heaven after the resurrection of Lazarus was also understood in one of two ways. There were some people who chose a naturalistic explanation. There were some who chose a supernatural explanation. Let me just read you a few verses out of John 12. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for they heard that he had done this miracle. And the Pharisees get all concerned about this. They say the world has gone after him and so on. Some Greeks come up and say, sir, we would see Jesus. Um, and uh, Philip comes and tells Andrew. Andrew tells Philip. Jesus says, the hour has come, verse 23, that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He's going to talk about that in John chapter 15. Fantastic passage. I was having that passage in my devotions, one of the passages I read this morning in my devotions, marveling at the fruit idea that Jesus gives there and the steps for bearing finally much fruit. Won't go over that right now. We're in 12. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. 
Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Now listen to the next verse. Jesus speaking. He just raised Lazarus. The people are there, all excited about it. The Pharisees have complained. Everybody's going after him. The Greeks have come and said, Sirs, we would see Jesus. And the message gets word of mouth down to Jesus. And Jesus begins to talk about how he's come for this hour, which is the cross. In verse 28, Jesus says, Father, glorify thy name. It's the end of what Jesus says. Then listen what happens next. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Everybody heard what went on. They're going to have to come up with an explanation for what just happened. Jesus just said, Father, glorify thy name, and a voice comes out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Now listen to what they say in verse 29. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake unto him. A naturalistic explanation, a supernatural explanation. Do you understand that as you go through life and see things happening around you, either you're going to give a naturalistic explanation for it or you'll give a supernaturalistic explanation. When you get over on the supernaturalistic explanation side, you've got two choices. Either that was from God or that was from the devil. You need to make sure that you're making right choices, folks, because as you go down this maze, as we might say, of life, you're coming to corners and you're going to have to turn right or left. And when you make a decision, it will affect every other decision that you ever make. That's what's happening with the plagues of Egypt. Every time Pharaoh hardens his heart. Every time that you and I harden our hearts. Two possibilities here. You know, the same thing is true today. The exact same evidence of this complex world of nature is visible to everybody. From animist to Hindu to Muslim to Buddhist to secularist to humanist to atheist to Christian. Same evidence is available to all. Some realize it's supernatural, but then they make their own choice like the Pharisees did, and they ascribe the world to the pagan demon gods, the 330 million Hindu gods, for example. There's not one god out there. Or they describe divine characteristics to nature itself, like the animist does. Some realize they're supernatural, but they make the wrong choice, like the Pharisees did, and ascribe the world to the pagan demon gods. Second, some reject the supernatural entirely, and they explain everything in terms of naturalistic causes. The most obvious group among those are those who are evolutionists. Sadly, there's a third group. Compromising Christians try to blend the naturalistic explanation and the supernatural explanation to be accepted by the militant atheists. And when they do that, they steal glory from God like the theistic evolutionists do. You know, as you look at the text all around this, the magicians, actually at plague number three, caught on that God was at work. The real God was at work in the plague of the lice. But Pharaoh never did seem to catch on, even though there was no naturalistic explanation for that plague of the lice. You can talk about a naturalistic explanation for the plague of the blood. You can talk about a naturalistic explanation for all the dead fish and dead frogs. One following after you. What's the naturalistic explanation for the lice? The magicians got it. They said, whoa, there's no way. We can't do that. God just turned all the dust of Egypt into lice. No naturalistic explanation. That kills the naturalistic argument that the humanists like to have against the ten plagues, not to mention all the other incredible supernatural keys that we just mentioned a few moments ago, like the timing, the freedom of Goshen from the flies, and so on. A man must willfully reject God in spite of the evidence. God always gives a way open to hell for the man who is insistent on rejecting him. Just like God always gives a possible explanation for 
for his work, like the naturalistic explanation for the voice of God, the naturalistic explanation for the plagues, the naturalistic explanation for the creation. That dual possible explanation is also seen here in the plagues. The naturalists will look at the plagues and say, oh yes, the logical order of the plagues is that one plague caused another plague. It was all just by natural causes, so no supernatural explanation is necessary. And then they'll go on in their blind unbelief. You know, the Apostle Paul explains that phenomena as a judgmental blindness. Second Corinthians 4.3 But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. The God of this world is Satan. God uses the evil angels in the plagues. God uses Satan to blind the minds of those who are not elect, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, and here we get back to creation again. Folks, you cannot get away from creation. We have to teach creation to our young people. The devil is using it to blind their eyes. Look at that third verse in this passage. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you understand why creation is essential? Do you understand why I get passionate about that? We can teach them all kinds of other things. But the God of the world is blinding their minds with evolution. So the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, cannot shine unto them. In creation, God said his first words, Let there be light. And there was light. Yom Echad. Book of Elilah. Morning and evening. Evening and morning. Lila of a Booker. Jesus, you know, said the same thing that Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 4. John chapter 9, Jesus is healing a man who's blind from birth. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, they had some odd ideas, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. God predestined a blind man. Not because God looked down the quarters of time and saw that he would sin, so God said, I'm going to fix him, I'll make him blind. Not because God looked down the quarters of time and said, whoa, his parents are really into some very dirty, mean, bad stuff, so I'm going to make their kid blind. Do you know how to answer people who say, why does a good God allow bad things to happen? I hope you do. I have preached many times on that. Then Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Let there be light, not darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. He spits on the ground, makes clay, puts it on the blind man's eyes, tells him to go wash at the pool of Siloam. He comes away seeing. The Pharisees are all antagonistic because this is done on the Sabbath day, and they've got this big argument. Man, he healed this blind guy on the Sabbath day. He must be, he must be from the devil. They're still making wrong choices. Other people are saying, well, how can somebody who's not from God heal a man who's born blind? You know, I mean, that's, a, that's a pretty tough one there. I know we did it on the Sabbath. What do we do? All this Sabbath stuff that we believe, you know? Folks, Jesus is God. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus specifically confronts the Jews over and 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 over again on the Sabbath. They'd gotten all ground together into their one tiny little petty mind, thinking that was the most important thing in the whole wide world. And forgot that there is a true and living God to whom we must give an account. So they call this the man's parents. They say, uh, well, we know that our son is born blind, but we don't know how in the world it is that he's now seeing because, you see, the Jews had already agreed that anybody who, who confessed that Jesus was the Messiah was going to be thrown out of the synagogue. And ooh, they were kind of shaky on that issue. Wishy-washy, wishy-washy, wishy-washy. 
Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So they called the man who was born blind and said unto him, Give God praise. We know that this man is a sinner. <laughs> he was giving God praise and they weren't. Sort of funny that they would be pushing on him for that. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. He wasn't trained theologically. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. I know the facts. Here's what happened. They said unto him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered, I have told you already. And you did not hear. And he's got a sense of humor. Wherefore will you hear it again? Will he also be his disciples? <laughs> they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. Moses. Where are we going back to? Moses. Egypt. Moses. Plagues. Moses. Crossing the Red Sea. Moses. Wilderness wandering. They're Moses' disciples. Did they hear what God said to Moses? Did they hear what God said through Moses to Pharaoh? Were Moses' disciples? We know that God spake unto Moses, but as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. You get the idea that they are being deliberately, willfully, stubbornly, recalcitrantly blind? He answered them, and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, sense of humor, that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began. Where is it taking us back to? Creation. Isn't it interesting how many times those things show up in Scripture? If we just pay attention. Moses plagues. Since the world began creation. Was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? Oh, we've got a seminary degree. And they cast him out. Now listen to the next few verses. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him. You've had light come into your body. I've just healed the organ of sight. And you have seen him. And it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment. Do you remember the plagues? I am come into this world that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And here's our key. Here's Jesus saying the same thing that the Apostle Paul will say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin, but now you say we see. Therefore your sin remaineth. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Jesus gives that to us here in a nutshell. Well, our time is up. I wanted to make a little break at this point and, and list all ten plagues for you and show you which of each of the ten gods of Egypt were being attacked or were being judged by that plague. But our time is up. And we'll have to save that for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you so much for your word and for its power. How we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the creator. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of man. Life and light. And it's John's Gospel, beginning with creation, that we always go to when we want to lead somebody to Christ, and yet we ignore the foundation that he is the creator as well as the redeemer. Father, once again, we thank you for your word and for its power, for the judgments that you sent upon Egypt, for the judgment that you will send yet upon this world. And for the things that we're supposed to learn about that here in time present. Because we're still battling against the forces of darkness, the forces of hell, the forces of Satan. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
and the battle is intensifying. And you've given to us the armor of God to be fully clad in it so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. But most of us have taken it off so that we might dangle our feet in the water and hum stupid melodies to ourselves as we look at the clouds. Father, I pray that you will make every one of us convicted of our own personal sins, cause us to confess those sins, to repent of them, to turn from them, to be engaged in the battle that is all around us, that Jesus Christ would be glorified, whether by life or by death. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 500.